Have you ever had pickled walnuts? Or have you ever tried watermelon cake? Well, if you've never sampled any of these delicacies from Michigan's past, we'd like to share with you some of the things that Priscilla has discovered while researching old Michigan cookbooks. And later on, I'll be demonstrating some of these old recipes. Walnut pickles, by the way, were made by picking walnuts when they were very green, not when they were ripe, just so that you can stick a pin through it and then pickling them in a manner similar to what you'd pickle cucumbers. Watermelon cake, on the other hand, was not made from watermelons, but it resembled a watermelon with white on the outside and red on the inside and sprinkled with raisins to be the pits. It was very good. Priscilla and I have researched many of these old recipes. We've hunted down cookbooks for years. We've got hundreds of them. And we took a look at what people were eating in Michigan in the 19th century up until the period of World War II. Some of our cookbooks, for example, Dr. Chase's Recipes and Information for Everyone, was published in Ann Arbor in the 1860s, and it's chock full of interesting recipes as well as recipes to how to take care of a sick horse and other things like that. The Grand Rapids cookbook was not only a cookbook put out by H. Leonard's and Sons, but it was uh, also a catalog of all their various products, many of which uh, we're going to talk about a little later. Uh, Muskegon in the 1890s, uh, the ladies of the First Baptist Church of Muskegon, Michigan, put out a cookbook and all the members contributed their very best recipes. And then we can go to Science in the Kitchen by Ella Eaton Kellogg, who was the wife of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg of Battle Creek, the man that invented granola and peanut butter and cornflakes. Well, she came up with a variety of very healthful recipes. Now, some of our um, recipe books show illustrations, and we, uh, this one, for example, Wayman's cookbook shows a typical 1890s cook. And using this illustration and other illustrations, we had a costume made that's very appropriate for the turn of the century, what a cook would have worn at that time. Now, uh, cooking in the very early days in Michigan would have been over a fireplace. And something like this would have been used, a pot like this in which it sat on a crane, hung over the fire, and of course could be tipped or moved with, uh, with a long stick like this. This would have been the main tool that they had in early pioneer days. <clears throat> but things improved, and uh, of course the lumbermen came in in the, 1890, in the 1860s, and uh, from 1860 up to 1890, lumbering was the most single important aspect of Michigan's economy. And we had more sophisticated methods of cooking for the shanty boys. Something like this, for example. This weighs 50 pounds and was used in the lumber camps to fry salt pork and bacon and things like that. Later on, of course, griddles like this came into being. This happens to be a Griswold griddle. The Griswold Company operated in Erie, Pennsylvania until they went out of business in 1937. So if you're looking around in antique shops or used uh, shops of any type, watch for Griswold ware because you know they're at least 50 years old. And of course, cast iron cooking utensils, uh, we're convinced through experience, are special. It's a special way to cook with and it gives you results unobtainable elsewhere. Now before us, we have a variety of implements that would have been used in a typical Victorian kitchen. Things were very much different then, you have to remember. There was no uh, electrical products. Everything was used according to your arm. Elbow grease was the single most important thing that a, a, a housewife had available in those days. Water, you didn't walk to the uh, spigot and turn it on? No, you had to pump. And this would be a pump that would be inside the kitchen and when the housewife wanted some water, she pumped it. This often ran down into a cistern in which they collect rainwater, special soft water. Salt boxes were important. Nowadays we use a salt shaker and get about all the salt we need. However, in the 19th century, people had a tremendous craving for salt, judging from their recipes. And so they would have a box like this very near the cooking where they could reach in and sprinkle pinches of salt or with a little uh, special salt spoon pour out. 
As I said, everything had to do with the elbow. Here's an early potato masher. It's a very, it's a double one, and it's very functional. And uh, you have to remember that America also was an age of entrepreneurs and inventors that were eager to develop some product that society needed, and so they patented some of the strangest utensils you'll you'll ever find. Coffee grinder. It wasn't simply a matter of putting already ground coffee into the coffee pot. You had to buy the beans and grind them up like this. And then the ground product would be removed underneath like this. Butter molds are something that were quite common. And remember, this was real butter. Oleo was not available until the late 19th century. And then uh, it was not anywhere near the quality of oleo margin we have today, but individual housewives would make their butter and then scoop it out with a, something like this and uh, mark it with this uh, pretty imprint that made it very wholesome looking. <coughs> a cabbage slicer, coleslaw and sauerkraut were very uh, important in the early days, particularly by German people. Uh, that settled in Michigan, and you would take a head of cabbage and run it across there and get your coleslaw. And uh, popcorn poppers. These are still seen every now and then, but it's a far cry from the electric popcorn popper. In this case, you uh, put the pop in, popcorn in and ran it across the stove or a range like that, and uh, it tasted very fine, too. Everyone raves about the old-fashioned popcorn. Even at the, uh, the table, for example, you see very artistic artifacts. This is a napkin ring from the 1870s. And some of these products, it takes a lot of searching to be able to know what they were actually used for. We bought this because it was pretty. We didn't know what it was used for until I found an old catalog that's a special syrup pitcher in which the syrup, rather than dribbling onto the table, would dribble back into the bottom of it. Priscilla, you've cooked with an old wood-burning range. Why don't you tell uh, something about your experiences in doing that? Oh, well, there's a lot of difficulty because you had to get up very early in the morning and get it, the fire going, and depending on what you were cooking, but your big meal was at noon, so you started off with a big breakfast and got everyone off to school or out on the farm to watch what they were doing, and then you had, but you couldn't tell the temperature of the stove. And so the women used to put their hand in the stove to see how hot it was. And for instance with bread baking using a mold like this and they'd put it in, well if they kept their hand in tw 20 seconds and their hand was very hot and they started to yell, then that was just right for bread. Now a few of the other gadgets that they liked to use was, oh for instance this apple core and they would use that, they'd put it on like this, and then they, it would peel the apple, and then it'd be all sliced up and ready for an apple pie. As well as to take the core out. Yes. And then we have your cherry pitter. So you didn't have to do it by hand all the time. But it was still the elbow. Yep, Women always. had strong elbows always. in the 1890s. Then we have your meat grinders. A lot of things were ground up. They, they, all of your leftovers were ground up. Your vegetables, your meats, your fruits, everything. You never wasted a thing. And here we have, this is a grater. This would be used for your cheeses and different fruits for canning. And here we have a pea and bean slicer. You can show that one. That this is, is a nutcracker. And, he, and this is a very good, it just moves it ahead just a little. And as you can see, cracks the nut, and you can get the whole nut out. But these were all conveniences for them. You know, that they just, you know, to them, they save so much time. Ice cream maker. This is uh, from the 1890s. Some of them are wooden. The outside is wooden, but you put. Uh, ice with a little salt on top to make it even colder to melt faster and filled it full of cream and some flavoring and again the elbow round and around with the elbow the children didn't mind doing that one though. no this is a little burner that they might use for making a quick lunch it's a kerosene burner similar to a kerosene lamp 
only you could actually cook on it, and although it does stink the kitchen up pretty badly. I might. As I said, there were entrepreneurs ready to come up with gadgets for any problem in the household. For example, have you ever been unable to get the top off of a, a jar? Well, this unlikely looking gadget was designed just for that. You put a, a, a jar like that into it, got it good and tight, put the ratchet down, and then held it like that and turned it. Go ahead. You can see why you didn't make a fortune on this because it doesn't work that well. <laughs> but it was somebody's idea. Took two people though. And uh, just like today we have gadgets for just about everything. Uh, back then they had individual cast iron implements. This is uh, called, known as uh, for making apple skiver, which is a Swedish uh, sort of a cupcake and it's a, a specialized product. Um, over here we have an implement used to make waffles and this would set on top of the wood burning range and you'd put your waffles in and as you can see it was all based on wood. Well what we would like to do now is to actually make a couple of these historic recipes for you. Priscilla will share with you a couple of recipes from Kalamazoo that we have discovered. This is a recipe that I'm going to show you how I put together. It's called Chicken Supper. And while I make it, Larry's going to tell you a little bit more about it. Well, first of all, this recipe comes out of New Crumbs of Comfort that was published in Kalamazoo in 1906 by uh, the ladies of the St. Luke's Church. And the ladies sent in some of their best recipes. This particular recipe was sent in by Mrs. L.C. Chapin, whose husband was the Lawrence and Chapin of the foundry. The building still stands as Vermeulen's Furniture on Rose Street. This is called Chicken for Supper. You start out by boiling two chickens in as little water as possible until the meat separates easily from the bones. Pick it all off, cut it rather fine, and season it well with pepper and salt, which you have already done. Mm -hmm. Now put in a mold and she says in parentheses, a bowl or oval pan will answer. Next, some slices of hard boiled egg, which Priscilla is doing. Always putting the best slices of egg at the sides and the bottom of the mold and the broken pieces to the chicken. Boil down the water in which the chicken was boiled until there is a pint left, which you have right here, I believe. A mm -hmm. pint, pint, pint of, of the broth. chicken broth. Adding to it, when done, a large pinch of gelatin, which has been dissolved in a little cold water. I use just a package of it. Season this gravy with butter, pepper, and salt, and pour it over the chicken. It will sink through, forming a jelly around it. Let it stand on ice until perfectly cold. Remember, they had to let it stand on ice because there was no electric refrigeration at this time. So they would have a block of ice put in a wooden refrigerator, as they call them, and let it stand. Then turn it out on a dish and garnish with bleached celery leaves. Now, we have used lettuce. Uh, bleached celery leaves are a little hard to get nowadays. Uh, in Kalamazoo, in the early days when Kalamazoo was known as the celery city, famous for its celery, the celery was a special variety known as bleached celery. The uh, growers actually put boards over the celery and produced the effect similar to putting a rug over grass. It, it's bleached and white. Well, they would do that for a while over the celery and get a beautiful, tasty, white variety of celery with evidently nice white leaves. So you may have to substitute lettuce. It is to be sliced at the table, Mrs. Chapin goes on, and it's delicious, served with cucumber dressing. That's the end of that. Yeah. Now, you want to Now, the for the next course, this historic meal, we have what is known as a ham puff. This also comes from New Crumbs of Comfort, and this was provided by Mrs. W. H. Brown. Now, the first time Priscilla made this ham puff, 
it really puffed up very high and it looked almost like a turban or a cook's hat coming out of the pot. This time when she made it, I, I think you'll see it looks more like a beret. So it does not always puff up to quite the same extent, which tells you something about historic cookery. You've got to rely on a lot of experimentation, and you're never going to know exactly how it comes out. Um, I, it's of interest to note to me that right above this recipe by the ham puff occurs a recipe called a luncheon or supper dish that was provided by Mrs. C.A. Van Dusen. She would have been the wife of Edwin Van Dusen, uh, who was the first superintendent of the Kalamazoo State Hospital, and very prominent in Kalamazoo history, donated the land for the first public library that was constructed in the 1890s, and uh, was one of Kalamazoo's finest citizens. That is part of the fun of going through these books, uh, placing the names of the people that have contributed. The ham puff recipe calls for scalding one pint of milk in a double boiler. Add a half a cup of butter. Have you done that? Mm-hmm. It's going right now. Okay. When melted, add a smooth thickening made of one cup sifted flour mixed with cold milk. Stir until smooth. Take from fire. Let cool, then add the well-beaten yolks of eight eggs. Then fold in the whites well-beaten. Salt one and a half cups finely chopped ham. Bake in a dish standing in a pan of water. Many of the recipes call for that, uh, to put the dish in a pan of standing water. We, we think... Uh, well, the wood stoves were so hot that they burnt the bottom of so much of the food, and they, this way it protected them. And so with this recipe, you could just cook it in a usual casserole pan. Now Priscilla is using an interesting implement here, which she's going to, you're going to beat the eggs with this? Yeah. Right. Can it, no, you can't. No, <laughs> no go ahead. But uh, this is, a, again, one of the ingenious devices they had in the turn of the century. I open and you there. Can, here, you can, uh, go to work. Okay, you can, in this case, we're going to beat up the, the yolks of the egg. But this, uh, the advantage this has, it's also a measuring device in which we it's have uh, a pint, and a quart and all various measures already on there for us, including some that we don't use up use very much nowadays. For example, we find a gill. Now you might not realize it, but a gill is four ounces or a half a cup. And then they also had measurements such as a walnut sized piece of butter or salt the size of a pea or a bean or uh, <coughs> They even have measurements using an eggshell, water that'll fill the eggshell. So you just have to experiment, and we've had our disasters, and we've had our successes. Get her mixed up good. All right. Everything was hand, hand done. They took, we have a lot of the recipes that uh, tell you that you have to beat the eggs for a half an hour. You know, and the woman sat there for a half an hour and beat it, just as you sifted your flour <clears throat> three and four times. Right. Time was of no, uh, wasn't any consideration. A good cook needed to spend the time that was necessary, and, and the recipes uh, indicate that a great amount of time was spent in a hot, very hot kitchen. You have to remember that the ranges were... Uh, fired by wood, and so it would be a very, very hot uh, summer and winter both. Well, in the summer, a lot of the houses that, at least if they were a little well off, they had a summer kitchen that would be a porch, and it would be off the back of the house, and it would be uh, windows or screened in around, so the woman at least was a little bit cooler when she cooked. We have some other recipes that we've selected for today. We have from a Friend in Need, a collection of uh, well-tested and practical recipes from the ladies of the First Presbyterian Church of Kalamazoo, published in 1899. Celery soup, supplied by Mrs. N.H. Stewart, the wife of a lawyer in town. And then from the Eastern Star Cookbook, uh, published around 1920, in which we have the frontispiece of the old Masonic Temple on Rose Street, we find peanut butter muffins supplied by Mrs. C.H. Brown, which are very interesting. And they turn out like this. And then from the parchment cookbook from 1926, we find a recipe 
for brown bread. And that, in this particular batch, turned out like this. Next time it might be higher, it might be lower. It just varies. <laughs> No. Now this recipe was supplied by Mrs. Jake Kindleberger. Kindleberger is the man who started the town of Parchment with the Kalamazoo Vegetable Parchment Company. And this is a recipe for brown bread, two tablespoons of molasses, two tablespoons of brown sugar, one cup of sour milk, two-thirds cup of wheat flour, and two small cups of graham flour, one teaspoon of soda, one teaspoon of salt, Steam two and one half hours or bake one half hour. By the time of the 1920s, we find that they're actually telling you how long to bake these recipes. Earlier, it was nearly a matter of uh, bake until done, usually the recipes indicated, or bake in a moderate oven until done. And that's where the woman would stick her hand in to find out how long she could hold it there, to know if it was moderate or not. And finally, I think, to round off our uh, Kalamazoo turn of the century recipes, we need to have some celery in a uh, utensil that was common on the, on the uh, table as a celery holder. Because as Every I said... Every household had one. And they ate lots of celery, and it wouldn't have been the green Pascal celery like that, Kalamazoo celery. So there we have a typical luncheon from the turn of the century. Well, now that we've whetted your appetite with some of Priscilla's historic cookery, perhaps we can uh, let you hear something from the past. I'd like to play a recording of Yes, We Have No Bananas on this Victrola that was built around 1910. We have to open up the doors for the volume, give her a couple cranks, release the brake, and place the head down on the phonograph. As we take a look, at uh, some of the artifacts we have in our home. This song was popular in the 1920s, and I hope you've enjoyed it also. And remember, whether you're enjoying historic cookery, or listening to old music, or reading about the past, the most important thing is to have fun and enjoy it. <laughs>